So welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. So in this session, I'd like to discuss floating point numbers. So how does the computer represent fractions of integers? And maybe you think, okay, maybe he just takes a large integer interval and divides it by a constant. Yeah? So maybe it's some kind of equidistant discretization of some, some interval. But the way this is done, the way the floating point numbers are constructed is quite clever because it has some uh, nice properties, but uh, still strange things uh, can happen. And for these, it's nice to understand how they are defined and constructed. So we discuss here the IEEE 754 standard. So it represents a subset of the real numbers, which are called here the floating point numbers. And this floating point numbers is encoded by three integers. So I will use these three integers here throughout the definition of the floating point numbers. And actually the set of floating point numbers is defined in three steps. And the integers are used sometimes differently. Um, well, there is the first guy, which is the sign. So S is an integer which encodes the sign. So whether we have a plus or a minus in front. Yeah? So um, actually for this, it's enough to have just one bit that indicates the sign, you know? zero or one. Yeah. So it's maybe just a minus one to the power of S. Then there is the C and the C is somehow encoding the value of the floating point number equidistantly distributed in a fixed interval. So that is somehow the value. Now, for example, in a fixed interval, let's take the interval from one to two, two not included. Okay, so that's maybe just a small interval. Um, the C encodes now the value discretized in this interval. But I would like to have many of these intervals. Um, then we have the E and the E is giving me the scale. So it is like a factor two to the power of E. So I can make the number larger uh, if I make E large, or if E becomes negative, I can make the number smaller than one. That's the main idea. So we use three integers. So the integers use different ranges. Yeah, For the S, our sign, well, one bit is enough. Now I can decide how many bits do I use for the, the C? If I use P bits, then my C can go from, say, for example, zero to two through the power of P, not included. Now it's an integer, an integer from zero to two to the power of P. Um, and then I can decide, okay, how many bits do we use for the exponent? So for the exponent, I use now R bits and like for the integer where I now have a range of two to the power of R, uh, I can now decide, okay, what is the smallest value for this integer and the largest value of this integer. So there are bounds, yeah. Uh, so the smallest possible value of E is this E min minus one. 
And the largest possible value of this E is this E max plus one. Uh, now, okay, this notation is maybe a bit strange because you think, okay, why doesn't he call the smallest possible value not just E min? Why is it E min minus one? So E min is not the smallest, it's the second smallest. And why doesn't he call the largest possible value not E max? So he calls it E max plus one. So E max is the second largest possible value. And indeed, if you now calculate how many values can we represent, we can represent here E max minus E min plus two additional values because it is minus one to plus one, plus one because there is the zero. And this has to equal two to the power of R. So why um, is it called E min minus one and E max plus one? Because the E min minus one value has a special meaning and the E max plus one value has a special meaning. And I will discuss this later. And without this special meaning, the E is between E min and E max. Yeah? So I have E min between e, uh, e min and E max, and I have two special values, the largest and the, uh, the smallest one. So you see this is, there is a small footnote here uh, in an earlier version of the lecture. Actually, I used just E min and E max for the bounds, uh, but then in the literature, this you, you sometimes observe the other notation. So I'd like to be consistent with this. Yeah, um, you can now decide how many bits do you use for the C? How many bits do you use for the exponents? Yeah, there are different uh, conventions. And then you have another bit for the sign and you can now use um, a 32 bit combined register for these three integers, or you can use a 64 bit. And if you use 32 bit, it's the single precision floating point number with 64, you have the double precision floating point number. I will show you the concrete values later. At this point, just remember that we have here our three integers, S, C, and E, that we now use to encode the floating point number. So the set of floating point numbers contains the so-called normalized floating point numbers. That's the first, first set that is inside the set of numbers we represent. So let P, E min and E max be given. So I have chosen the corresponding value. So how many bits do I like to use to represent the number C? And what is the range to represent the exponent. Then the normalized base two floating point number is given by, okay, so it's minus one to the power of S. So this encodes the sign, yeah, minus one or plus one, multiplied with one plus C divided by two to the power of P multiplied with two to the power of E. Okay, so the sign factor is maybe clear. If you recall that my constant C is between, is an integer between zero, including, and two to the power of P, not including, then you see that this guy here is between one included and two not included. So then if you would like to represent the two, the C jumps back to zero. Then this guy here is a one and the E is increased hmm? times two. So the exponent then gives me the next interval from two to four, yeah? and then from four to eight and so on. 
So if you like to draw a little picture, then you see that the E is encoding the values two to the power of E, two to the power of E min, two to the power of E min plus one, and then an interval twice as large, two to the power of E min plus two, and so on. So it's encoding somehow the scale. And within the scale, I take an equidistribution. So these guys have always the same distance. The distance is one divided by two to the power of P. And I'm just creating this partitioning within each of these intervals. So you have these guys here. And this is the set of normalized floating point numbers. So you see that at larger scales, it gets coarser, but there's a nice little property. So the nice little property is that the relative distance of two neighboring numbers is approximately constant. I will look at this, but before I look at this, let me make another remark. There is a large gap here. And more striking, zero is not part of this set. Okay, so well, zero is maybe um, an important number I would like to represent in my computer, and maybe I have to fix this. So before we fix this, yeah, a few remarks. So we already saw that this part one plus C divided by two to the power of P is in the interval one to two, one included, two not included, and it performs this equidistant partitioning. Um, then maybe also interesting, uh, what is the, smallest positive normalized number. So for that um, positive, the sign, uh, the S is zero, the sign is a plus. Uh, then I choose the C to zero. So I have a one plus zero. So I just have a one here in front. And then I choose the smallest possible value. The E is equal to E min. Uh, so I have a two to the power of E min. So this here is the smallest possible number. So you see it here, this guy is two to the power of E min, the smallest positive number we can represent. And note that there is this uh, gap, yeah, no number from the interval from minus two to the power of E min to two, two to the power of E min is part of this set of normalized floating point numbers. We had this nice little feature that two neighboring normalized floating point numbers have approximately the same distance on the large scale. So what do I mean with on the large scale? So I mean that this holds for all ranges. Yeah? So it holds uh, independent of the E. So I like to look at the relative distance. So that means I choose two normalized floating point numbers, say the um, X1 and the X2. If the X1 is a normalized floating point number, it has as a representation one plus C divided by two to the power of P times two to the E. So the next number is the number where C increases. Um, so the next number is the one where I have here a C plus one. Note this also holds if C is already the last possible number. Yeah? So for C equals two to the power of P 
minus one, uh, we would have C plus one is two to the power of P. Yeah. Then uh, this here would be just a one. So you see that here inside you have just a two and this is exactly what is happening. This guy jumps to zero and this guy increases. So these two formulas are also correct for the case where C is already the last number. Yeah, so I have these two formulas for the neighboring guys. So now if I take X two minus X one, and I would like to have the relative distance. So the relative distance means that I divide by the X one again. So then you see, I have a two to the power of E here in every guy. So this two to the power of E cancels. Then in the difference, I have a one in every guy. So this one cancels. So, and I have a C divided by two to the power of P in every guy, so this cancels. So all that is left here is the one divided by two to the power of P divided by the number, but now without the scale, because this scale has already been canceled, the number between one and two. Yeah, one included, two not included. So I know that this fraction here is inside the interval from one divided by two to the power of P plus one, not included, to one divided by two to the power of P. So the relative distance is at most this one divided by two to the power of P. This is a very nice property which will later tell us that we have a certain bound to a relative error, at least if we stay in the normalized floating point numbers. So if we stay away from zero, you know that relative errors, yeah, they are maybe not meaningful if you can achieve zero because then you are dividing here by a zero and the error becomes very large. Okay, so if, if we are in the range where relative errors matter, we have a bound to the relative error. And that's the thing why this construction is very nice. So in addition now, that computer can represent um, a smaller set of numbers. And this other set of numbers will fix that we have this gap and it will also contain the zero. So there is another set of numbers, the denormalized numbers, and it also contains, well, this is nice, x equals zero. So what are the denormalized floating point numbers? So my P is as before. So choosing the number P that tells me what is the range for the C. And also my E min is chosen as before. And now the denormalized floating point numbers, X is given by this definition. So we have again the sign, though there's the minus one to the power of S. We use here the S from zero and one. And then there is the C divided by two P. And there is the two to the power of E min factor here. So you see that this here is suddenly switching to a different representation. This here is now an equidistribution of discretization points in the interval from zero to one. Before it was from one to two. Uh, so recall, if you have the normalized floating point numbers, so you have one plus C divided by two to the power of P times two to the power of E. And now 
um, if you move the E to the next level, so the smallest level for a normalized, yeah, normalized floating point number would be E equal to E min. So the two to the power of E min is the last, the smallest normalized floating point number. So the next level you would go to would be E equal to E min minus one. So for E equals E min minus one. Okay, that would be an interval from two to the power of E min minus one to two to the power of E min. So that would only be an interval that is half the size of what we need because the n, the zero would be here. So instead, we now extend the interval. Yeah? We make it larger by a factor of two and we extend the interval down to zero. So making it larger to a factor of two means that it is now an interval between zero and two to the power of E min. So you could write this number here as, so maybe just write this down here, say minus one to the power of S multiplied with C to the power of two P. And then I can write, okay, maybe I need a bit more space here. Two to the power of E plus one for E equals E min minus one. So that looks a little bit strange. Okay, so why did I do that? So you can also write it like this. And now you see it's a representation that uses the C and that uses the E. And from this plus one, you see that in this representation, we have made the interval here twice as large huh? because we would now like to stretch here over twice as much the area. But instead, we have moved here from one to two to zero to one. Yeah, so you can also write it in this representation. And the nice thing that you see now is that we just have E equal to E min minus one. And that was my remark that um, the value E equals E min minus one has a special meaning. The thing is that this encoding here is switched on if the E is equal to E min minus one. So we have for E equals E min minus one, this representation, and for E in between E min and E max, the, the normalized floating point number representation. So the only thing is that he is using here uh, this additional factor of two and the other guy here. So he's switching a little bit the representation when the E reaches this value E min minus one. Okay, so that is still, we are using S, C and E, but if E has this special value, we have this representation. So you see that the denormalized floating point numbers give me here this nice equipartitioning in this interval from the, that was left from the normalized floating point numbers. A funny other thing 
uh, we have two zeros, right? There's minus one to the power of S times C equals zero. So we have a plus and a minus zero. And these numbers really exist in the computer and have a meaning. So this fills the gap and we have uh, the zero. And here you now have the picture of the normalized and denormalized fleet floating point numbers all together. So we have the denormalized ones that create here these numbers and we have the normalized floating point numbers that create actually all these guys here inside. And of course, also the, the scales. So I'm, I, I made the scales in blue. And we have a very nice discretization. So in addition, there is a third case. So the floating point number can take some useful other values. And these useful other values are now um, related to the case where the E is this largest possible value, the E equals E max plus one. And if E is equal to E max plus one, this is a special thing. It is plus or minus infinity. Well, depending on the sign. Uh, so we have here the sign. If the C is equal to zero, if the C is not equal to zero, then the case E is equal to E max plus one denotes some error. Uh, so for example, not a number. So for example, this is, if you take the square root of minus one, you will get this value. So he's encoding some results. Huh? And it's like the integer. He's just going on with the calculation and just creating this value. And this completes our encoding. So now we have all possible values of E, yeah, S, the sine, and um, the C. So I have a remark on infinity, but we will discuss infinity later uh, to conclude. Um, there is still the choice, how many bits do we distribute uh, to the exponent? How many bits do we use for the uh, mantissa and uh, the floating point uh, double numbers, which we will often use. They use uh, an 11 bit exponent uh, and we have the P is equal to 52, yeah, so we have 52 bits. Yeah, let me take just five minutes for a very small um, code session for a very small um, numerical experiment. And then we are done with this first session because you already see some puzzling things are going on. So, what is the smallest positive non-zero floating point number? Yeah, so double min value. Uh, I could go back to the slide and just find it, yeah, the smallest value, but let's just try it in a computer. So let's create here another, very quickly, another experiment Maybe we can repeat this in the next session. So I now call this say uh, floating point arithmetic experiment. Okay, I would like to have a main method where I create some stuff. Um, so let's have small headline. Uh, I would like to find the smallest positive number. Well, and I search for it in a special way, two to the power of 
k. Yeah? So I would like to have this 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 guy. So how do we get this? So I just start with a guess. I call this guy tiny. So I start with a guess. It's just one. And now I make tiny smaller if I can make it smaller. So as long as tiny is tiny divided by two is larger than zero. Okay, so maybe it gets rounded to zero at a certain point. But it could also happen that it gets rounded to itself. Yeah? So in that case, there is no improvement. So as long as I have an improvement, so tiny divided by two is smaller than tiny. So as long as this happens, I would like to make tiny smaller by dividing by two. So actually as a mathematician, you would say this loop runs forever. But in the computer, this is already the first thing. It doesn't run forever. And let's print uh, the tiny. So the tiny, so what is the tiny? I just print it here, tiny. Okay, and let's run this program. Okay, wow, it's a small number, 4.9 times 10 to the minus 324. Um, okay, so now you can go back to the slide and you can see uh, what's this tiny, what, what, what is this tiny? So, well, it should be two to the power of E min, right? Because that's the smallest possible normalized floating point number. Uh, so maybe I just print this. So two to the power of minus E min. So the E min is 1022. Um, well, this is not correct. Huh? And if, if I now print this, I believe we see that it's not correct. Because we still have the denormalized numbers and the denormalized numbers have in front even a smaller factor. Yeah? So I can choose here C equal to one, and then I get another factor one divided by two to the power of P. So I get another two to the power of P. So I have another minus P here, and the P was we used 52 bit. So I have another 52 here. So let's try that. Okay, and you see this is correct. Huh? So maybe make it a bit nicer and you see that is tiny. And now I want to conclude, finish with a small, maybe obvious, but also puzzling thing. Um, what happens if I divide a tiny by two? Uh, so what happens if I divide tiny by two? So let's just write here tiny divided by two. Uh, what happens if I divide tiny by two and after that I multiply with two again? So I multiply with two again. So that should be tiny again, right? Okay. And what happens if I do that, but I reverse the order? I multiply with two and then I divide by two. Okay, so let's run that. And we observe if we divide this number, the smallest number by two, we arrive at zero. Then if I multiply the zero with a two, I stay in zero. But if I reverse the operations, if I first multiply with two and then divide by two, I get the same number. So fundamental laws of mathematics are violated here in this computer. And that's the point where we will continue in the next session. Thanks.